the Knights of Ren podcast is brought to you by Cool Stuff Inc., your source for Star Wars Destiny singles, sealed product, and more. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. Show me again the power of the darkness. D20 Radio, where gamers roll. D20Radio.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to the Knights of Ren episode 503, and this is going to be a lot of fun. We just had a regional in Dallas where Legacies was legal, so we have a unique situation where the tournament organizer is allowed to use the most current set if product is available at the venue. So the tournament organizers for Dallas decided they're going to allow Legacies, they're going to allow the starter packs, but I do not believe they allowed Rivals because we didn't see any Rivals cards in any of the deck lists. So... With us this week are Rick, Nick, and Todd. How's everybody doing? Doing good. Go Pats. Uh, <laughs> not go Pats, but I don't really care that much, honestly. But I'm doing good, too. Awesome. So let's discuss a little bit about just the thoughts on Dallas allowing the the legacy stuff to be legal. I know the community has pros and cons, but what do you guys think about having access to these cards at a tournament technically before the set is released, but it is within the rules of Fantasy Flight Games for the tournament organizer to make that call. I mean, I'm glad that they did do it, but I can see how people might be a little upset about it. Um, but they gave plenty of notice. They, you know, it's like week, two weeks before the event. They had already stated it, that it was going to be legal. Now, the fact that they have legacies at the shop and that they ran the tournament at, I don't really think that matters one bit because it's not like somebody's going to be running in there and being like, oh, I need to get 14 boxes so I can ensure that I build this deck. Right? It, it, it doesn't matter. If you didn't have your deck going into that day, you weren't playing legacies anyway. So, I mean, I'm glad that they did because I, for one, am pretty burnt out on EAW uh, and was ready to see some new stuff happen. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think it was an awesome call. I mean, it, a lot of people had felt like the uh, EAW meta had gotten a little stale. Um, they wanted to see some new decks. People wanted to play some new decks. I think the hype with Legacies started back in November and everybody was waiting and waiting and waiting and, and wanted to play it and wanted to have it available and this was a, a good opportunity to get it out there and have a large scale tournament to see kind of how it shakes out and i thought it was great yeah i'm really excited that people are doing it a little early because i know they're doing it in portland next weekend which i'll be at and just like we all almost everybody that wants the cards at this point probably has them so it's like the fact that we couldn't that some places wouldn't allow it makes it just feel kind of terrible it's like i, I spent all this money on the new cards well i want to be able to use them and then the new tournament's coming up and i mean i haven't played a game of empire at war for a while now and I'm very excited that I will not have to play any regionals in Empire at War myself. Now, do you know what you're going to be playing yet? Are you still kind of fidgeting around which deck you're going to be, you know, testing hardcore? I have not picked anything <laughs> particular yet. I've been trying things out. I can tell you what I'm not going to play. I'm not going to play Obi Maz. I'm not going to play Seven Sister OTK. And that's about the big ones that I've decided that I don't want. To, I don't want to do R2P2 style deck like a R2P2 itself or like Poe Isla or Poe Yoda. Maybe I don't. That doesn't really appeal to me a whole lot. Yeah, not enough Guardian in those lists. Well, it's, it's not just that, but. <laughs> well, there's a new battlefield that kind of fixes that problem for you. And that happened to be in the first player's deck. And we get an interview with him later on in the show. So get excited. We're going to be having Eric Wainwright, who took the whole thing. And I'm really excited to talk about his deck. But before we get there, there were a lot of really interesting things kind of shaking out of the woodworks. And I want us to just kind of take a moment to discuss just this, this exciting new meta that we're about to experience. So when we're talking about Dallas, there were 56 players that showed up. We don't have every single deck list. We don't know what everyone was playing, but we do know quite a few of the decks that were in the top cut. So we have a Ayla Padawan Padawan. We have a Po2 Yoda. There is a Rainbow Fives or you know, it's there's a lot of variations on five dive villains now. So the one that was in the top cut, as far as we're aware, it was Mother Talzin, Balatik, and the First Order Stormtrooper. Also, Zach Bunn was piloting his infamous Han Ray. So we're going to, you know, sit down and talk about that a little bit. There were decks with 
Hondo and Poe. There were the Tarkin Seven Sister decks. There were the OTK decks. There were other kind of interesting things that were kind of making. And you've got your Maserati. And the, the most interesting thing that I found was that there didn't seem to be a really heavy presence of Kylo 2 or the Kylo Ren Starfighter. And there wasn't a heavy presence of any specific deck. It seemed like a lot of players going to this regional were trying something unique to them. And I think that's a great thing at the start of a meta game that even though we've had the cards on Tabletop Simulator for a while, there isn't this dominant deck just showing up, crushing everyone and winning the whole event. Even, you know, your yellow number five was there. Someone said it was at one of the top tables. Nice. Todd, what are you guys thoughts on this that there's a lot, I think, more diversity than we've ever seen before. I think part of that comes from the fact that there's just a lot of like good cards and legacies like there's the power level and legacy seems pretty high at base. There's not a lot of like just crap tier characters the way we've seen other sets where it's just like very obvious. This character is overcosted. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's unplayable. You look at every single legendary character in this set, and there's a, quite a few of them. None of the legendaries cost more than 16, except for Zeb. It's 17, which is also not bad. Like, the, just the price point of the characters allows for some really awesome combinations. And Hero has also got a really solid, aggressive character at 12 with Isla. And also, they have Yoda for the support. Like, there's, there's just so many characters that you can fill and plots to help fill that as well. I think this just, there's so, so many more options and there's a lot of things that are viable so it's, it might take a while before the meta actually settles into something that's i don't know <laughs> stable yeah i mean it's uh like you, you take a look like like nick said those those characters i mean i don't remember the last time i played a legendary character in a in a tournament deck just because they're usually pretty high costed and then they kind of flipped the script on us and made some super cheap legendary characters for this one and you know the rares are also still very good you know the 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 upgrades there's some good ones in there uh but i think this is probably the first set that we've seen where the characters are outshining a lot of the upgrades you're, you're seeing a lot of decks with you know the the awakenings block uh upgrades with you know interjecting legacies characters into them and you know that's sort of part of a product of you know we know these are good these are stable you know let's just upgrade it a little bit with the character selection uh and what we can build out of it and then just kind of stick to it the uh the ayala padawan 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 if you look at it it's there's some crazy stuff in there but it's pretty much ray padawan padawan you know from yeah from Awakening. but with like a character that actually has good right. dice so yeah, I mean it's 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 looking good. It's a good baseline weekend of of decks to kind of take a look at. You know, the the decks that people thought would dominate didn't really do so. And I think a lot of the people that have been playing on Tabletop Simulator kind of figure that out too. Obi-Wan Maz was doing well in the beginning of the tournament, uh, but kind of petered out once it started hitting the top tables. It's a deck that's pretty easily to put, easy to put together, easy to build. It kind of builds itself. You kind of have to figure out what you don't want in that deck because there's so many good things for it. But once it started hitting the top tables, it's, it fell away pretty quickly. But yeah, I think all in all, it was a great weekend to see what people people were able to put together for legacies yeah it, it looked like to me uh, uh, exactly what you said rick it looked like a, people took a lot of what was tried and tested and proven and spiced the characters up with their new legacy stuff that like nick said filled the gaps that these other weaker characters from the previous sets did not fill which is cool to see um, I, I don't think this is by any means... I think we're going to see a lot more stuff come out. I don't think anything that we saw yet is going to be like meta-defining. Um, and that's good. I think it's very broad spectrum right now. Um, and lots of options on the table. Um, we're going to need two or three of these to really see where it's going to go and how it's going to end up. Yeah, and that's what's really the most exciting is we've got regionals coming up very quickly. So the, the most interesting thing is we've just gotten a small taste of what we're going to be experiencing here in the next few months. So I've got a regional coming up in a couple of weeks. Nick's got a regional coming up in a couple of weeks. Rick and Todd are in the same place. And we're about to see in different states these metas kind of shake out and see what people are experimenting with. And I think that it's a good show 
show for the game. And like we keep saying, it's not this one deck that everyone feared. A lot of people thought Obi Maz was going to be the most dominant thing because it's easy to build. It doesn't require a lot of legendaries. It's, you know, quote unquote, easy to pilot. And that's not the case. In fact, the top four decks that we're going to talk about in Dallas were completely unique. So there was the Five Dive Villain, which had Mother Talzin, Balatik, First Order Stormtrooper. There was the Han Rey. There was Po 2 and Yoda. And then Ayla, Padawan, Padawan. And I, I also find it interesting that we've shifted from a villain meta to a hero meta. And I know people were clamoring for that because ever since Awakenings and Spirit of Rebellion, it was a really heavy villain meta and there just weren't hero options. And then Empire Or started to shift things around. Then the two player box set shifted things around and now with legacies there's still some very potent villain decks but hero decks are still very strong and hitting the top tables much more frequently than they have been yeah i mean you make shields relevant and now heroes are, are doing pretty well plus you give them some non over costed options of the characters and this is what happens things kind of kind of even themselves out i mean villain is a little bit behind the curve or not really behind the curve but they're 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 not as represented in whole as the heroes are right now. But, you know, it's looking at the stuff in Legacies, I can see that changing. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff that Villain picked up. Shields are still going to be, the, you know, tough to get through. But, you know, you got some more options that came out there, too. I mean, steady damage is still available. You know, we're, we don't have a, a balance of the force that's come out or anything like that. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hit that stride in the beginning of a meta where, you know, aggro is pretty prevalent. We'll see what the top end of the uh, the damage dealing in the early rounds of the games are uh, and see where it goes from there. But yeah, I mean, you're, you still got to fight through shields. Like it's, it's not like they really went anywhere just because... Yeah. R2P2 wasn't represented very highly in this uh, in this tournament. It's they're still there, right? Right. Speaking of the balance of the force, do we have any kind of number on how many decks were running Ayala or Ayla, however you want to say that? At this point, no, we're not sure of what the deck spread was, but I wouldn't be surprised if she was extremely popular. Her points yep. are really good. Her dice are really good, and she fits into a lot of decks. Plus, she's got you know soft mitigation built into her kit, which is really nice because when we take a look at Eric's deck, he doesn't actually run a heavy amount of removal. And, you know, people are kind of curious as to why. And some people have also stated on Facebook, you know, Ayla's dice have, you know, this kind of soft mitigation built in where she controls your dice to what you want. And then she can control your opponent's dice to something they don't want, which will force them to either allocate cards to reroll or spend their mitigation to basically undo what you just did, which kind of helps give you tempo or, you know, force them to get rid of options that they really wanted to play in exchange for getting better dice on the table. Yeah, I don't think that that's like that crazy of a thing for mitigation, though. Like, I don't think that helps too much as much as it's just that fact that it's also just a very aggressive deck. So its mitigation is just going faster than your opponent and killing people so that you don't have to deal with it. And the Ford and Axis battlefield for Guardian. Right. No, I, I agree. It's just kind of something in there that helps. It's an extra tool. In all honesty, I think she Ayla would have been fine if her special red or instead of both. It's kind of crazy that you get to do both. I think that alone is kind of what pushes her over the edge in power level right now, even if you're not always rolling the special. I, I agree. So we'll have to keep an eye on that, but... I mean, if, if, if they were ever to errata her, that's the kind of thing that I would like to see hit. Otherwise, they're probably just going to balance the force her someday if, if she's a problem. But like, it's like that that could have been an ore power. It's like sometimes you don't need the focus and sometimes you really need to save them because it's basically like the opposite of Mother Talzin because like, hers is on the rolling out and Alice is on her special. And you don't get to do both for Mother Talz. And if you could do both, that'd be insane. <laughs> So let's talk about this new Mother Talz and Five Dive villain. So the original variation was Sienna Ree, Balatik, and a Night Sister. So you got access to all the colors. You had a lot of guns. You had some focus. You had Balatik who could reactivate and just, you know, crush people. But it was a really squishy deck. But you had five dice on the table. The new Legacies variation is Mother Talzin, Balatik, and the First Order Stormtrooper. So you still have quite a bit of guns on the table. You lose the Night Sisters ping effect where you can deal damage to her to reroll any die. You still retain Balatik. And you're getting rid of Sienna for Mother Talzin. But her effect states, after you activate this character, 
character, you may reveal the top card of a player's deck, so yours or your opponent's. If the cost is an odd number, turn one of that player's dice to any side. So if you target yourself and you flip odd, you can flip one of your dice to whatever you want. If you target your opponent, it's the same thing. So you can't target a player and then flip whatever die you want. It has to be that player's deck, that player's dice. So is Mother Talzin a better replacement for the Night Sister? Because, you know, some players would say no, they'd rather have the Night Sister because you can do it every time as an action when you need it. With Mother Talzin, you have to sequence her appropriately if you're trying to disrupt your opponent or, you know, give yourself a die advantage based on your deck construction. I don't like the Night Sister, really, personally. She's not high in my regards, but Mother Talzin, having played only a few games with her, if you you build a deck that has like 25 or more one or three cost cards you know like the so that's odd your consistency with her ability is pretty much guaranteed and that feels awesome it feels awesome if you're using guns it feels awesome if you're using like holocrons to be able to be like oh i'll roll out mother talzin and i will turn my force throw to a special what are you going to do about it like <laughs> that feels awesome being to always have your force throw show special right after you roll a character out like i'm not saying that's the best variant i'm not saying it's the best with five die i, I don't know where she's best i was trying her with maul and maul just feels kind of terrible from having played several games with it and talzin felt awesome maul felt terrible i think she could be good with callus too and I, I do, I think she's also great with five die. So if I ever do five die stuff again, I definitely do Talson over the Night Sister Sienna version. It just might have money problems if you're running a lot of odd cost cards because you don't have anything free hardly. Yeah, you're trading that randomness of the Night Sister. You know, it, it, it is very random. Uh, I'm very bad with a Night Sister. I never know when to ping to do to, to reroll their die or ping to reroll my die or, or, or whatever. But Talzin, like Nick said, if you build it right, you're almost guaranteed at the very least to show at least one, two damage side every time you roll out. And those characters, they, they have a lot of twos on them, right? Like the uh, the stormtrooper and Talzin themselves have a lot of base side twos that they can roll out, which helps with the Balatik modifiers, which helps with the modifiers on the upgrades and whatnot. So, I mean, it, it takes the consistency level up more than one notch, as far as I'm concerned with this deck. Uh, you, you equal out with the same amount of hit points, um, so you're not really trading off there. You get a better target for uh, the best defense. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I think it's just a straight upgrade. Now, there are people that can, you know, that have mastered the Night Sister, so you'll probably see some that are still running it with her, but I, I just don't think that you can you can change the consistency level. The using it on your opponent's die is so random, right? You have no idea if you're going to hit with that. Unless you have crystal ball. Unless you have crystal ball. But I think that kind of, I don't know if that really gets a slot, but I mean, it could, right? You, you would know right away yeah. if you're going to hit it. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I would ever use it on my opponent, you know, unless I had to somehow get them off of that damage, uh, a damage uh, spike, uh, break a bunch of modifiers or, or save a character or something. I might go for the home run there and get that. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it seems like a straight upgrade to me. I'll say going back to season four, when this card was first spoiled, this, like I, I said it then, I thought that was going to be the new five die um and and she's solid she's solid all the way around um i think the bigger thing that comes out of this too well not the bigger thing but an additional thing is this is uh the first time that you actually get to put a card in villain that actually heals because you get to play witch magic with her oh and that goodness, build that card is so good so and it's and if it's built correctly and you hit it right that's a three for one heal so that's that's a huge swing especially on characters that have lesser health but yeah i think i think it's phenomenal i think it's gonna be really good i do think this is gonna be one of the the upper class of decks as it's hammered out and, and figured out fully I, I really like this deck i liked it back when we first saw it and i'm, I'm interested to see where it goes how it evolves I and mean, the one issue i see with it is the upgrades that you'd want to use in this are mostly two cost yeah I, I canto bite pistol get that redeploy right gun. yeah i mean you got the dh17 you got the canto bite but the the good ambush uh yeah uh, yellow weapons um the, the bread and butter of five die basically just is super counter to her ability right so you, you got to take some concessions when you're building this to uh i think it slows it down a little bit but the added uh consistency with her ability kind of evens it out there i don't think you'll have a lot of turns where you're playing multiple 
multiple guns uh, onto your characters like you you could with uh, Sienna and Night Sister, but just the 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 added consistency of almost always hitting at least a two side on something uh, and then being able to go off from there, it it kind of evens it out a little bit. I think you slow down a little bit, but you have higher damage potential like higher spike or more consistent damage potential sure so let's move along and take a look at the second place deck which was po2 and yoda the battlefield was frozen wastes the plot was fortify and the deck list was handwritten so it was sent to me in a photograph so i'm like 90 percent sure this is correct there might be a little bit of a discrepancy but as far as we're aware this is an accurate deck list so there were two caution two overconfidence two defensive position two retreat two Force Illusion, two Field Medic, one New Orders, one Sound the Alarm, two Planetary Uprising, two Adapt, one Repost, one Lightsaber Pull, one All In, two Poe Dameron's Blaster, two Canto Bite Pistol, one Obi-Wan's Lightsaber, two Handcrafted Light Bow, and two Force Speed. So right off the bat, I want to talk a little bit about the Legacies cards that are in this deck. So we're looking at Obi-Wan's Lightsaber, the Canto Bite Pistol, which is very interesting. Just for adapt. the replay. Well, it, it also has the special. Yeah, and the special. You've also got Adapt. And I mean, like the, the big card I heard that was really powerful in this deck was actually Retreat. Oh, yeah. Because it, it helps too. eat the OTK decks and the five dive villain, which uh, let's go over real quick. You know, what is an OTK deck if someone doesn't know what that deck is constructed of? Uh, so the OTK deck basically means one turn kill or one round kill in this basically the idea of like doing you know 20 plus damage in one round to be able to finish off whatever characters you had alive at that point for the most part the only thing that that refers to right now is the seventh sister and then a red character like sienna and a guavian or a balatik the tools you have are basically reading seventh sister over and over again within a round with stuff like price of failure to defeat your your other non-uniques or your, your other little guys and then stuff like leadership to be able to ready her again and faint to throw extra secret droid dice out there just the idea of just kind of getting to go like four extra times and using boundless ambition to have extra rerolls for tons of damage in one round the reason why retreat is a great piece of tech is when you play the card your opponent only gets one action so you you limit the capacity of those decks to go off and play out shenanigans to consistently re-roll and from what we've understood from the event and you know firsthand experiences from other people who are actually playing the the tournament this card was actually very important in not only this deck but other decks this and hyperspace jump were basically anti five die and otk tech to shut out these massive plays where you just keep rolling gratuitous amounts of dice focusing them out and getting just huge numbers of damage they shut down Tark and Seven Sister pretty well too, because that usually takes a little bit of time to to get everything done. Because you want to you got to roll your characters out, you got to get Tarkin's ability. You probably want to focus and then do da- do more damage. So you're you're almost like a mixed damage deck in that sense, because you're going to take a little while to get your stuff done with that. So Retreat works. It really works well against almost everything right now that isn't like Obi Maz, which is just as fast, if not faster, than this Poe y- po Yoda. Yeah, the best time to hit this Retreat against the one turn kill decks is after the Price mm-hmm. of Failure. You know, they Price of Failure. If they do it before you claim, you know, then you retreat and then they basically just killed a character to let them roll back in, you know, or, or potentially claim at that point. But yeah, they killed a, ca- a character to claim. That's what they did. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. I mean, I can see this definitely being something that is pretty easy to fight that deck. You got to know when to hold on to it or when to have it or when you think they're going to try and go off. But, you know, at two costs to be able to have that effect, uh, you're almost guaranteed to be able to get it off when you need it. Uh, the hyperspace jump is a little bit difficult, uh, a little bit more difficult to do, mm-hmm. but uh, still another option that you would have. The uh, OTK deck too, like, is still mostly Empire at War cards, even though it hadn't really shown up until fairly recently. And it's it's exact situations like retreat, hyperspace jump, uh, even like coercion, like against the price of failure. There's so many options for just completely shutting this deck down and it basically completely falling apart in one swoop. So while it might be a big deal now, it didn't win this tournament. 
And I don't think it's going to be a huge thing going forward. People are seeing it for the first time now and it's new and it's scary, but there's so many ways that you can simple tech your deck to like retreat could be good against a lot of decks, not just this, but it's just super good against this OTK style. So let's take a look at the legacies cards. I think the most interesting one that was listed out of the whole deck is the Canto Bite pistol just because it's <laughs> it's a three drop with redeploy and the best way to describe it is essentially an old school lightsaber. So the Canto Bite pistol costs three resources. It's a neutral upgrade weapon. It has redeploy. The die faces are three range for one, two indirect damage, one shield, one resource special blank special says deal two damage to a character or three damage instead if it's a villain so i i think in the current meta uh especially with everyone fearing uh kylo 2 and his starfighter this is an awesome card it's gray so it'll fit in any deck it has three damage sides. It has redeploy. Uh, it, it's got everything that you want to have. The three kind of hurts, but three damage sides, redeploy, it's gray, and it works really well on Poe. I mean, yep. like, that's that's it. That's why that card is there. It's in there for this. Like, it's not crazy. It's just solid, and it's not, like, like you compare it to, like, Stun Baton, and it's still like, oh, well, yeah, this is still like worse than the, the riot baton thing. But it's not like that much worse. And there's definitely situations regarding specials that it's notably better. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's in there for the special chaining and that it's got a range side that matches up with Poe. Uh, and it and, and it'll, it also spits, splits your colors up a little bit better. So Kylo 2 and his Starfighter don't hurt quite as bad. I don't think we'd see this unless it was significantly more powerful if it didn't have redeploy, though. Like that, that still is right at the heart of what makes this solid yep. even if you have to like override it with something stronger for what you need after it gets redeployed personally i don't like three cost upgrades that don't you know have a major impact on the board but in this deck where you have poe and you have yoda to be able to turn that to a special and immediately resolve it the fact that if poe dies yoda's pretty vulnerable he's not going to be outputting a lot of damage without some upgrades so this one getting redeployed over like nick said either overrided or you know have some damage potential out of it uh i mean it's good in this deck i'm not going to tell people to go play this card because oh yeah. you know because i'm afraid of kylo too but again it, it's <laughs> it, it's good in this deck it's good in you know like an ayala po it's it's good where you can turn to that special and hit it and every once in a while you're going to hit three damage Damage. But like we said at the start, villains aren't as represented as heroes are right now. So you can just look at this as a lightsaber that's gray that's going to eventually be relevant for uh, for Kylo. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, I I don't know if it's like in this deck, I might have just played the lightsaber here, but you got a modified melee side, so you know it. it yeah. I mean, it's well, and the melee doesn't match anybody. Yeah. So, I mean, I, the Cantabite, I think, is a solid call, definitely over a lightsaber. Even if the lightsaber has the unblockable special, I think this is still a better call because at least the damage sides match up with Poe. Yeah, and just looking at the deck list, he only had one lightsaber in there to be able to hit the melee anyway. So, yeah, so yeah, it's de it's a better lightsaber for this deck. Yeah. I'm not going to go out and I tell mean, people to buy all these Cantabite blasters because they're the next hot thing. But it's I'm pretty sure Cantabite blaster is going to be $25 tomorrow. Tomorrow, huh? Yep, no, I don't know. That's going to be the going price. No, I don't know. That's sarcasm <laughs> for any <laughs> listeners. I'll sell, I'll gladly sell you one for twenty five dollars if you want to pay. Oh that. no, don't do that. Don't be that guy. Maybe we should start I'm that not. chain. I'll be honest. I just hold all my extra ones. <laughs> yeah, sell them to Agent of Zion. He can help. He can help you with that. Trade him for all your yeah, jar but his jars. quad jumper market didn't didn't fall through pretty well. <laughs> So I've heard. So another thing I thought was interesting was we're finally seeing plots, which we talked about in Awakenings. You know, what what's the deal with having a team and extra points you can't utilize? You know, what can we do? Please, FFG, give us something. And both of the winning decks were using different plots. And this one with Poe and Yoda used Fortify, which cost you two points. And it says after setup, give a character one shield. With that, and if you win the roll, that's three shields on someone at the start of the game. That seems really good. I mean, there's a lot of different plots. You can give yourself shields, you can give yourself cards, you can give yourself or your, give your opponent damage. There's a lot of different things that are out there. Do you think that the shield is the best option for this deck? I don't think you ever count on winning the roll with this deck. No, I mean, like, I don't know. You got, you know, you got four blanks on, well, you got four blanks on your dice. 
no matter how you look at it. Um, I, I don't think you count on that at all. So, I mean, I guess that's a good way to guarantee that you get at least one starting shield. Uh, it, it's probably the best way to look at that. Uh, the, the battlefield choice of Frozen Waste also encourages them to give you shields because they know you're going to be fast and you're going to be special chaining. So, mm -hmm. that encourages you to start with three shields. It's it's a tough call, man. I, I think it's a I think it's a smart opening and it's it's really strong because it puts your opponent on a back foot immediately. Do I give them, do I let them have three shields to the start or do I give them that battlefield that they're going to be ahead of me in? So it, it's cool. Like I really like the plots. I see a lot of this stuff in some of the deck builds that we've been looking at where you can use the plots to really get in your opponent's head right from the get go. Yeah, it is better than any other option here. Yeah, so right. It's, it's a whole lot better than just leaving two points on the table. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's perfectly fine in this deck. It's, it's a good choice. So. All right, and let's take a look over the deck list for the winner. And this is a this is a really interesting take. So this is the gentleman who also won at Team Covenant with Ray Padawan Padawan. And so he brought Elite Ayla Padawan Padawan. The battlefield he brought was Fort Anaxis, which allows your characters to have the keyword Guardian if you have the battlefield on your side of the table. The plot was Stolen Intel, which allows you to draw a card after setup. So you start with six cards in your hand. And then the deck had, and he sent me this in an email so i this is an actual accurate deck list he had two heirloom lightsabers two handcrafted light bow one ray lightsaber two ancient lightsaber one shoto lightsaber two force speed one obi-wan's journal two force illusion one bb8 one r2d2 that's the blue one from legacies with the special two lightsaber pulls two reaping the crystal two trust your instincts two guard, two caution, one force misdirection, one sound the alarm, one stronger you have become, and two power of the force. And the only event that's not really well known is stronger you have become, and that is a neutral force blue uncommon. It's an event that costs zero, and it states count the number of upgrades you have in play, reroll up to that many dice, yours and or your opponents. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on this deck before we go into the interview, because there's a lot of really good things in here. Yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of Stronger You Have Become. To me, it's just a better sound the alarm. I would probably have run two of those over the two power of the force, um, just because you're so light on, on mitigation here. But we already kind of touched on that. Yeah, I mean, that, that card can really do work especially in a three character deck that you're going to be playing a lot of upgrades on you know you, you have the potential to re-roll all of their bad dice and then re-roll all your good dice and say deal with it are you gonna discard a re-roll <laughs> are you gonna get rid of what i just rolled into you know the fact that you have four speed in here as well uh lets you mitigate and roll into better stuff and then resolve resolve your stuff yeah i mean it i, I love that card it's one of my favorites out of uh, the new set as far as the events go you definitely have to have like at least like three or four upgrades for it to become pretty good though yeah i mean in here this is what you're trying to do you're just trying to vomit out sticks and yeah i mean that's why you have two padawans yeah. uh move them over or move them around if you can and and you know it, they're they're just i got weapons i got dice this is what i'm doing here you stop me if you can uh i'm not even going to mess with you uh, unless it's a, a random force mis misdirection that I can get off pretty well, or you just roll out the nuts and I got to sound the alarm or caution or guard, excuse me. But yeah, it's, and the stolen untell to be able to roll into or to, to draw into multiple upgrades on turn one. Yeah, I mean, it is perfect. This is a straight upgrade to, to rape out of one. You know, it's when I first looked at this, I thought stolen intel was espionage. And I was like, <laughs> he's got a lot of one ofs in here and he's going to be discarding one random guard off the top of the deck. But then uh, I had to go back and look at this plot and uh, realize how good it was in here. So yeah, it's, uh, and you even get a BB-8, right? <laughs> It's got to be good, right, if you got yeah. BB-8 in there. Yeah, that, like, that's my only questionable card in the whole deck. Like, I'd rather have the second R2, I think, over the BB-8. I think it's like um like a Wilhelm scream for his decks. He's just it's bb 8 <laughs> Yeah, it must be. It's good. Like, well, 29 card decks and BB-8. That's just how it goes. Uh, yeah. And now he's got BB-9E for his villain deck. Excellent. So. We're good. Well, speaking of that, I'm going to sit down and talk to him and, you know, pick his brain about why on earth did he bring a BB-8? Why did he pick some of these cards over other options? You know, why is there a little bit of mitigation as opposed to, you know, what most decks in mid-range are usually running a little bit more removal and stuff like that. So let's cut away and see what Eric has to say about the Dallas Regionals. 
All right, so I am sitting here with Eric, who took a major win over the Dallas Regional, where Legacies was allowed. How are you doing? I am doing great. Welcome to be here. Glad to be here, Sugi. Yeah, it is great to have you. So a, a couple questions before we dive in. With Legacies Legal, did they allow rivals and did they allow the starter sets? Because I know some places are pro Legacies, but no rivals and no starter sets. So they did allow the starter sets and they had a lot of them there and they did not allow the rivals. Okay, so that's good to know right off the bat. So just tell us about what happened. I know you're from Tulsa with a lot of the people from Team Covenant. You know, you went down with Zach Bunn and Tim and, you know, other friends of yours. So why don't you just recap, like, you know, the starting point, you know, getting there, how the day turned out, you know, what you experienced throughout this whole thing. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we had eight people that came from Tulsa and like you said, we, uh, play at the team covenant shop there and, uh, Zach Bunn and Tim Bunner there. And we had six other people. And, uh, so it organically grew and we said, Hey, let's, uh, go down to Dallas. And so we, uh, got two cars together and, uh, zoomed down there. And I mean, it's something first time that I've done something, you know, traveling for something like this. And it was pretty exciting. And we had a lot of new people doing it, you know, Zach and Tim not with uh, not in that list, but uh, we had people just testing and grinding, and you know we had these cards for basically ten days beforehand, and so we were throwing all these lists together, and we had eight people, and we took down seven different lists. So I mean, it Ooh. wasn't like we got to the point where we we're like, hey, this is the best deck. We were still all over the place, and I mean, helping each other tune our decks and stuff. But everybody was enjoying what they were working on, and uh, it's kind of emblematic of our Tulsa meta. I mean, we tend to keep playing different things. And so even when there's, you know, all of uh, uh, FN or R2P2 or stuff, we've got a whole bunch of stuff happening on the weeklies and the monthlies. And so it uh, kind of suited our play style. So what steps did you take to prepare? Because I know that the meta in Tulsa doesn't necessarily follow what's considered to be like, you know, the national stuff where everyone's practicing on either playing R2P2 or beating R2P2. You guys are kind of doing your own thing. As we've seen with Zach, and he's always been piloting Han Ray with much success, you know, you, you said you had 10 days. What did you do in those 10 days to prep? Because that's a lot shorter of a time than most people are expecting when it comes to, you know, I spent a month or two months preparing for regionals. You had less than two weeks. Yeah. So uh, I, I was pretty heavily into a uh, uh, Quinlan Asajj deck during the EAW meta. And so when these new cards came out, I was looking through all the spoilers and everything. And I was like, there's almost nothing here I want to add to my deck. But I was like, very comfortable with it. I thought it was a fun deck to play. So that's totally what I was going to come down with. But at some point, the uh, heirloom lightsaber got spoiled. And when I saw that card, I was like, um, this is a typo, right? This is not actually a card that's going to be legal, right? Because I've played Padawans through every iteration. And this is like the exact card that I wanted from every aspect of it. So that made me jump back to my list and say, okay, what's going on here? I'm doing Kanan and Padawans and this new lightsaber, and it's going to be great. And so I was mentally going through that. And then when Stolen Intel came out, I was like, oh my goodness, one of my major problems with my deck is that I cannot have enough cards on my first turn. A, I need two weapons. I need some type of mitigation. I like reaping the crystal. I mean, very quickly, I ran out of cards. And so I was like, well, if I go back to my Ray, uh, as opposed to Kanan, I mean, that's a little bit of a downgrade, but maybe that'll work and stuff. And then when somebody said, Isla, you know, it's probably better than Ray, I was like, hmm, that might be true. So that's where that came from. And that all happened prior to getting the hands on the cards. So I didn't really know how well it was going to be. But uh, once we got the cards in our hands, I built that deck right away. And we just started jamming games and other people were doing, you know, all kinds of crazy off the wall stuff. So we kind of tried to test against an R2P2 and a Qui-Gon uh, Kanan because we just knew those were the things from the AW and it didn't fold to those. But we also knew that, you know, that wasn't probably going to be a significant part of the meta. So, you know, it was all open. So it was really, how did the deck feel? And part of it is I played it so much that I was comfortable with it. Now, you also have a claim to fame. You've piloted a Ray Padawan deck in a previous Team Covenant. Was it a store championship, I believe? So it was a thing called uh, uh, Destiny Weekend. So uh, the Covenant team got uh, Lucas to come down to Tulsa, made a whole... Uh, three-day weekend of it. We had drafts going on before drafts were a thing. You know, Covenant built their own type of draft scenarios. And uh, at the end of it had a constructed tournament. And uh, yeah, so, but that again was right after SOR had come out. And so both of my big tournament wins have happened right as a new meta happened. So I think 
probably one of the things that uh, helps me there is that I was just so comfortable with my deck that I think that gives me an edge on people that are playing a deck, you know, only a dozen times or something like that to just get into it. So a question we've actually seen a lot of people ask both from the Team Covenant event and this event is what's up with the BB-8? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, have gotten a lot of flack from that from my store and I've converted a couple people, but uh, there's a lot of uh, head scratching going on on the internet about that one. I mean, in general, I'm a huge fan of one cost supports. I like to spend my money every round. I think there's a big drop off on what money gets you as you get each round. Uh, it's worth less and less. And you can only put down your uh, upgrades on characters before you roll them in. And a lot of times by the end of that round, you're p- picking up a couple extra resources. And so you're bringing them over to the next round, which isn't bad. But if you have some way to sink them into something that can be valuable this turn, that's basically two rounds of an extra dice. So BB-8 was perfect for that role. And I've always appreciated him. And like, you know, you get him down turn one because that one in money you get or something. And he does work for four rounds. It's insane. So that was been in my deck and it's performed well for me. And uh, in this tournament, I mean, R2-D2 came along and I think that's strictly an upgrade. But I uh, thought about cutting BB-8, but he's just done so much good work for me and he fits in this deck. So I left both of them in there. <laughs> that's that's really interesting on your perspective on the economy. Can you go into that a little bit more just because that's not really something a lot of people cover in terms of it would appear that the, the economic value of a single resource kind of dips off the deeper you go into a game. So you're, you gain more value. Like a resource is basically like a one-to-one ratio on turn one, but it might be less than like maybe a one to 0.7 ratio by turn six. Like how how do you see that? Yeah. And so I would say by like turn three and four, your resources are worth like half or even less. I mean, and it's not so much the resource. It's the fact that and this is general, right? There are decks that don't care about this type of economy. But in general, you want as many dice rolled as many times as you can, because this is at the heart of it a dice game. The more dice you have, the less chance, the more chance you have to mitigate a random chance. And getting a dice in on turn one is worth an extra roll compared to turn two and turn three. And so getting it on turn one has that compounding effect, right? And if you turn into a resource, it pays for itself. If it turns into a disrupt, it disrupts them. I mean, all those things that you can do and damage is actually least of my worries on turn one, like disrupt and money is way more important to me on turn one between normal decks. And I don't know what the actual ratios are, but I really think by the time you get to turn three and four, that money that you, you know, like enrage is great on turn one. On turn three and four, a lot of times it's you're pitching it because one damage is not worth the money. I mean, you get into the point where, you know, people that aren't using it for that. And the reason is, is because, you know, getting a dice at that time might be only worth two rounds or even one round, you know, so that's kind of how I see it. Okay, and that's that's extremely interesting. I love hearing more about the economics of Destiny just because I feel like that's extremely important in micromanaging successful dice and card mitigation. If you can get a good grasp on that, that will really help improve your game because you'll be able to perceive what the value of a die face is at the point in the game in which you get it. Yeah. And so related to that, I think, I mean, I steer myself away from uh, dice with pay sides when I'm building partly because on turn one, I do not want to pay for it. Like, I, And even with uh, these Padawans, a lot of times after I've used all my rerolls, I'll be sitting there with a focus on a Padawan and another blank dice or something like that. And I could spin it to a two damage side or a one resource side. And I found... Definitely if I have something to play that turn, I'll spin to the resource side. But even if I don't, getting that money for round two is still probably worth more than two damage to me. Most of the times, obviously, there are exceptions to that. But uh, that's generally, I value it that much. That means that basically on turn one, if I've got a two for one side, I don't want to pay it. I'd rather just not pay it because I think the money is more valuable in most decks than that. So that keeps me away from those. And I understand there are decks that will blow you out turn one, and that's their game plan. And it doesn't matter how much you spend, because once you take that other character off the board, it's worth it. But in most of the games I play and what I'm trying to do, that's how I see it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your deck before we go into the actual event. So Something that you probably have known is that Guardian is extremely powerful and the battlefield you chose. Give us the down low on why you chose that, because as although Guardian is powerful, the Padawans don't have a lot of health to throw around. So are you using Isla as the Guardian target to keep the heat off the Padawans? So and this is how I play the deck. It's not necessarily the only way to play the deck, but I play it extremely slow. So I hardly ever claim. So during most of Awakenings, I was playing the one where you bounce a thing for a resource. And then after it came out with uh, the one that lets you resolve three dice, that's it basically doesn't help the other team very much. That's the one I chose. But uh, actually, on one of your podcasts, um, Nick was talking about how he liked the Ford Annex. And I was like, that's a really good point. Because the way I lose 
a lot of times is when they burst down a Padawan on turn one. So I always want the shield, like almost always will take the shields because it gives me extra survivability. But if they give me a battlefield, I will take the Ford Annex. I will make sure that I distribute the damage even between my Padawans. I just don't want one of them to die first turn before I have a chance to get the redeploys on them, make sure I get the value out of their ability. And then after that, if they're a two-character deck, yes, they claim, but two-character decks have a hard time using Guardian. And I also find that not everybody understands how to use it, and they're not even used to using it, so they underutilize the very powerful ability. And then if they are a three- or four-character deck, I can change my playstyle to try and speed up a little bit and maybe claim once in a while. And... That is a downside, right? I'm actually giving them value off the battlefield, but it's a trade I'm worth making because turn one for my deck is extremely important. And, you know, taking that two damage from one Pido on the other so I don't get bursted for seven is a big deal. Okay, that's that's really interesting. So go ahead and give us the recap of the event. You know, the first, you played, I believe, seven rounds of Swiss? We had seven rounds of Swiss, yeah. We had 56 players there. So round one, I sat down uh, next to a guy that actually played up at the uh, the Destiny Weekend thing, Ralph from uh, Texas, and he had an Eluk Yoda deck, and I was just excited to see that pairing because it's so thematic and everything like that. And so we sit down, and I have a good first turn. I have a good second turn. He's attacking one of the Padawans. He's uh, doing damage there. I've shielded him up. I've put Force Illusion on him. And then on my other Padawan, I had an Ancient and a Shoto. And I was like, he's already got a shield. There's eight health over there. You know, normally I'm a little bit worried about it, but I wasn't even thinking about it. And he came up with a turn where he played the two cost thing to resolve a dice and ambush and not have to remove it from the pool. He then four speeds, does something else. And basically all of a sudden Yoda Luke bursts it down for eight. And so I lose both my uh, weapons on that guy. I'm not so sad about losing a Padawan. I realize that they're squishy and one of them is going to go down, but I do really mind losing the uh, economy, the stuff I put on them, right? So that was a huge hit to me, and I was not able to dig back from that. So I started my tournament as 0-1 and uh, went on my way. And so the next round, I ran into an EZEB Ekanen, and that was uh, Peter from Houston. And we had a fun match. Um, we had an interesting time because I played an awful lot of Kanan double Padawan. And so I was very much aware of Kanan's abilities. And the way he was playing, I was like, I'm pretty sure he has Force Misdirection, and he's got all these melee uh, sign uh, sides on his deck. And I also had a Force Misdirection in my hand. And the way he was playing, I think he might have even known I had Force Misdirection. So we were playing this little cat and mouse game of rolling out and resolving. Normally, I'm a big believer in just getting all my dice on the table and then maximizing my rerolls and stuff like that. But here, you know, Force, mis or force Misdirection is really one that can blow you out there. So we had a cat and mouse game of that. I eventually used it to remove two of his dice. And sure enough, three turn or two turns later, he ended up having to throw it for a reroll. So that was a big turning point in that game. But but I was able to take that one down. Uh, the third round, I uh, met a guy from Wichita Falls, and he uh, was running E Tarkin, E Seventh Sister, and he had a good first turn and did four indirect damage or eight indirect damage to me. I had a really good turn and did eight direct damage to him. So Tarkin was sitting at three life after turn one. Uh, the next turn, before I was able to kill Tarkin, he was able to do his uh, Tarkin ability again. So he had done twelve plus a little more indirect damage, but I'd finished off Tarkin, and so the Seventh Sister then had to face. Uh, three Padawans, and it was an uphill battle for him there. So I was able to capture that one as well. So then into round four, I got to play against one of my playtesting partners, and uh, which is a bit of a bummer, but he was running uh, E-Wedge, E-Isla. And uh, partly because we'd been playing this matchup, I knew the most important thing to do was uh, Wedge's power action and make sure that you have a way to either remove those um, support dice vehicle dice or to have my soft mitigation like Isla just wait and hold on for that thing. Let Wedge do his thing, but make sure, you know, dice and Isla's dice do their thing, but make sure that uh, you take care of the vehicle dice. Um, the other interesting thing that happened there on turn one, he started with a four speed on Isla. I followed with four speed on Isla. He rolled out and I rolled out. He had a special on Isla and a focus on his four speed. I rolled out a special on Isla and a focus on my focus on my four speed. And over the next couple turns, basically, we were cat and mousing, spinning each other's dies to blanks, focusing them back, spinning the other person's dies to blanks. We'd used up all three of our dice. And basically, I think each of us got to focus one thing because of the exchange of that. So it was an awful lot to do about nothing. But uh, it's a pretty interesting little back and forth when you've got uh, her specials sitting on the table. But anyway, I was able to control the uh, support dice and able to uh, win that one also. And then I got in round five and met another one of my playtest partners, Mark. And he was running e Bala, e Talzin Trooper. So it's kind of like the uh, five die villain dice, but uh, getting e Talzin in there. And she has just an insane dice for her cost. I mean, her ability, I feel like, is gravy. Even without it, I'd be playing her. And so he was rocking that. And uh, unfortunately for him, 
He basically only got two guns in his first three rounds. So that is a hard thing to do when you're going five dice villains. So um, I was able to take that one. But uh, both Eugene and Mark at that point were X and two, and they both won out. And Mark was able to slide into the eighth spot, and Eugene was able to come back and get into the top 16. So that was kind of cool for our team. Uh, round six, I faced uh, EOBE Moz. And I think of decks there at Destiny Weekend or at the regionals, that was a deck that was most often there. But I mean, I wouldn't say it was like overwhelmingly there. There's maybe eight to 10 or something like that of it. But uh, this uh, player, Jimmy, was playing this one. He made it to top eight. And uh, I started attacking Obi at the beginning. He was shielding up as Obi does. And he got a four solution down on Obi and it was shielding. And at one point, I was sitting there with a two damage, a two damage, and a plus three modified damage, all melee. And Maz had taken one damage from an Isla indirect, like first round. And I was like, I do not want Obi's Force Illusion to be eating five of my damage. So I went ahead and switched to Maz, which was not my game plan. But uh, it took her off the table. Obviously, that hindered him somewhat. And the game still lasted a bunch of rounds because he is just a beast to chew through. Eventually, I got rid of his Force Illusions and was able to finish the game off with my uh, Power of the Force for eight, which he was like, um, what does that card do? So that was one of my things in my deck that surprised a number of people because it was kind of like having a no mercy on the hero side. So then I went on to round seven and faced uh, Epo Iota and uh, Tyler p- piloting that and uh, he the deck obviously shields up and gains money like nobody's business. I actually changed targets after he force illusioned from Poe with a blaster over to Yoda at some point and I'm not a fan of changing targets but force illusion sometimes makes you do that and he had actually it turns out played uh, the other player Tim Bunn who was running the same deck as me earlier in the tournament and end up winning against him. And the big thing he did there was retreat. And so he was digging for his retreats because like I said, I'm a slow deck and that deck is fast. So it special chains and gets out done with all it needs to do very quickly. And so a couple of retreats probably would, could have swung that and he wasn't able to find them. But again, I was able to use uh, Power of the Force to get a surprise kill on Yoda. And then he was three on one and Poe wasn't able to come back from that. Another interesting thing on round seven, the game next to me was Tim Bunn versus Zach Bunn. And uh, they were playing for a win and in, basically. They were both uh, five and one at the time. And so that was the Han against the Padawan deck also. So... And that was a extremely tense game. Like they said, it's one of the better games they've ever played against each other. And they've played a lot of games against each other. And Zach just barely pulled that one out to uh, get in. And then Tim's deck fell to a uh, ninth slot on the top eight. So he just barely missed the cut. So we almost had two of uh, the Padawan deck make it to the top eight. So that was the end of the Swiss rounds. And the uh, top eight looked like uh, the top spot was the Seventh Sister OTK deck that uh, made waves at the Galactic Qualifiers, and so it was undefeated. And then Zach's Hanre and my Padawan decks were 2 and 3 with the 6 and 1s, and then the 5 and 2 decks that made it were a Obi, E-O-B-E Maz, a Epo Iota, a R2-P2, I'm blanking on what the 7th place one was right now, and then the uh, 5 dice villain deck with uh, E-Tals in it. And uh, so I was paired against the R2-P2, and uh, so I got to play against Edgar, and he had double It Binds All Things on turn 1, but unfortunately, except for turn 1, I think on turn 2, he whiffed on getting a blue upgrade, which, you know, really makes that uh, suboptimal for him. But uh, I was able to, I mean, after that... I got a good first turn and just overwhelmed him with dice. So I was able to take that game. And it was best two out of three at that point. So we played another one. He also got a It Binds All Things on turn one again. And he had his battlefield, which let him uh, reclaim supports from the discard. And he was claiming every time, but he never drew a single support on his second game. So his uh, deck was stacked quite against him for both those matches. So after that, I moved uh, onto the top four and Zach Bunn had won his first round. So I got to play against him. And uh, Zach and I are both at the same shop and he's been playing Han Rey forever and I've been playing a version of Padawans forever so we've played this match a number of times and I think in general it's not a great match for me. I uh, dislike turn one uh, hand disruption and I dislike turn one uh, resource disruption because my turn one is very important to how this deck functions and Han Rey was you know stupid first turns all the way back at Awakenings, where you can put a ambush on Ray, roll Han in, and he can disrupt your two resources. Then they printed Frere Trade, which basically, if you get that in your opening hand, you can do the same thing, but you can fair trade if he gets one of his money sides. So basically, you've got a 50% side to really mess with their economy. And uh, so that first game, Zach roll, uh, ambushes on Ray, rolls in Han, has both the two disrupt and the one money side, and he goes in the tank, which basically means he has the fair trade. And so he's debating which of the two... Uh, 
ways to mess with me. And he goes for option number three, which is to play a truce, which gets him another money. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. He immediately uses that to overwrite his two-cost ambush weapon with an heirloom lightsaber, which is just an awesome card. But now he's back to zero money, and then he fair trades me with the Han dice. So now he's basically gotten five money, three or six money for this turn. Three he's already used on lightsaber, and the other three he's already disrupted me for one. And he's also sitting there with a two disrupt on his dice, all before I even have done anything. So that is pretty unideal. But the way this deck works, I was able to drop an ancient uh, lightsaber down with my first action. His downside is when he does all those cool things, he only has one card left. So his turn was lackluster for the most part. He uh, rolled out Ray and did his one reroll. And I think he uh, used a discard to take away my caution that I'd drawn. But I rolled out my four dice on my Isla and on the Padawan that had the lightsaber and I had two resources sides. So I'm sitting with an heirloom in my hand and I really want to get the heirloom on the table so I don't start behind because my deck really wants to have its two weapons down. But he's sitting there. He re-rolled the uh, crush, but Han re-rolled back into the crush again. So I'm sitting there with the new blue uh, mitigation that lets you roll dice equal to the number of upgrades you have in your play, yours and your opponent's. And so I decided to go ahead and use that on Han's dice, even though with him having all that money, he could spend to a three blaster side. If he spends to either money side, Ray's got a modified money over there. So basically, this is, you know, a suboptimal play, but I really wanted to get my lightsaber down. He rolls into the money, picks up money. So he's up to five cash now. At the end of the round, he's going up to seven. So basically, he'll be able to pay for anything he wants to for the rest of the game. But I get my lightsaber down and am able to do six damage to Han uh, on that turn, even after um, that. So I rolled extremely well to get back into it. And uh, so now it was a situation where if he, you know, gets things that are can spend all his money on, you know, he's going to be quite ahead. And I really have to be on the race side to kill Han. And I'm normally on the other side of this battle where I want the game to go a little bit longer, keep people alive and win through attrition. But here I knew that he was going to be a uh, resource ahead. So it was quite the uh, tough game. And I eventually was able to take out Han and it came down to Ray against Isla both pretty stacked and uh, I was able to squeak that one out. So then he chose his battlefield for the second round and he does the ambush weapon, rolls it, the smash and the money on Han and again, fair, fair trades me. So it was a uh, two in a row of getting Han raid by Han Ray. Uh, <laughs> but once again, I was able to get two weapons down to have an okay first turn. And I think he took the uh, indirect damage from Isla that I had on the Ray that time. And Han had already shielded up a whole bunch. So I decided to go for Ray this time first, which led to an end game where he got to do second chance and shields and stuff like that. So it was a longer grind of a game, but I was able to come out on top again after that one. So then I got to move on to the finals and play against Tyler. And he was the guy I played in round seven, the Epo Iota deck. And uh, I probably had the best two openings that I had the whole tournament. Um, the first one, I got uh, seven uh, resources worth of upgrades and supports down on for turn one. And um, I mean, the number of dice out there was just overwhelming. He's got, you know, spot stuff and he wasn't able to keep up. Um, I killed Yoda pretty quickly and he went ahead and scooped and went to the second game. And on the second game, I think I got six uh, value versa worth of supports and upgrades down on turn one. So it was an avalanche of dice coming his way. And uh, uh, I was able to take that one home. Excellent. So I'm noticing in some of these, you know, top cut games, you're playing out a massive amount of upgrades. So are you focused more on making resources in, instead of dealing damage? Yes. I, I eat, Maybe the heirloom I'll roll once or something like that, but I don't even mind taking the uh, extra resource off of the heirloom. But on the Padawans and on Isla, I will take resources every single time. The deck used to be uh, bring a whole bunch of two cost upgrades to it back in SOR days. And so you get one on each of the Padawans and that felt great. And then when uh, Reaping the Crystal was printed, I was like, well, you can get a three cost and two cost when you get Reaping the Crystal. And then when I had Kanan added the deck, he had the extra focus side. And I was like, I almost can get that extra money. So I just started building my deck to do a three cost and a two cost on turn one. And that is almost always able to happen. I mean, when it doesn't happen, it's a uh, oddity. So I'm almost always starting with the three cost and two cost on my two Padawans. So going back to the SOR meta, the problem there was 
my three cost upgrades were almost all not redeploy. You had lightsabers, which are probably not exactly worth three, except for the fact they have redeploy and raise lightsaber, which was good. But that is definitely helped a lot because of this uh, crazy card, the heirloom lightsaber, which makes it very safe to drop it on a Padawan turn one. So as you're playing through the game, it's very tempting, I would assume, for players to look at a Padawan and try and squish them as quickly as they can and basically invalidate some of the resources you've invested in that character if the upgrades don't have redeploy. So what are you doing to keep these Padawans alive? Because we're seeing the damage output of these decks get bigger and you're playing with a deck that have fairly squishy characters overall. Yep. So if I have a redeploy weapon, I put that down there first because it's safe. If I have a not redeploy weapon, I try and wait to put it down until, and I tend to be slow, wait till they've chosen a target. So if they choose that guy that doesn't have anything on him and I don't think I'm going to get a redeploy on him, I might not uh, put the redeploy there because losing that resource would be uh, really bad. But I also have things like caution and uh, force illusion that I might drop on it to try and say, okay, you know, if you want to kill that guy first, you're going to have to work for it. If they, if I put something on Isla, which is not the priority, but I will put my four speeds or my journals of Ben Kenobi on her on turn one and they take her down turn one, that's obviously bad. But basically the way I lose these games is if you can burst down one of my characters turn one, and especially if you can take down uh, something that I spent resources on. So like I said, it's not a huge deal. I'd rather keep them alive, but it's not a huge deal to take a Padawan if I get to re- use that ancient uh, heirloom lightsaber turn one and then also get to redeploy it. It doesn't feel horrible, especially if that's all you, they did and they didn't build any board or something like that, which normally if you're doing seven plus damage, you know that's basically all you've done your first turn, except for put down one uh, upgrade or something like that. So, um, but yes, so it, it's, I mean... I am mulliganing hard for two weapons and one of my zero cost mitigation cards. So, and that includes guard, which is just an all-star caution is the other one that's there. So those are the ways that I try and keep them alive. But I mean, I do lose games and that's probably how it happens. So another card that you mentioned that's kind of an oddity in the deck is Journals of Ben Kenobi. Tell us why you picked that and what the purpose is in your you know strategy. So my deck early on wants money and it wants cards and... Journals of Ben Kenobi does boast those things. Uh, it doesn't hurt, but I, I would be playing it anyway. But Power of the Force goes off of number of uh, upgrades, and so that helps that count. But on turn one, I'm rolling out my journals, and the number of times I get to re-roll or focus, I can normally get my money back. Or if I need a card, I can get a card. And the situation is, if I have money, then I'll probably want a card. And if I have cards and no money, then I want the money. I mean, it's just perfect. And I'm kind of surprised more people don't play it. I mean, I understand it's a one cost. And one of the issues is in decks, you only have so many upgrade slots to use. And so it, you know, by late game, it is not impactful enough. And so you want to have three other upgrades on it. But I think it is a wonderful early game and even a mid game card. It's okay. So um, I feel like it pays for itself turn one. And then after that, it's all gravy. And I can't stress how much I love that and trust your instincts any way to do something and then get an extra card, those extra re-rolls when I have this massive amount of dice on the table is, you know, how I am able to utilize all the dice. And earlier you were talking about the deck has the ability to shift momentum if need be, and you've got two force speeds, you've got some other tools and tricks in the deck, but can you Tell us a little bit how how does that work since you're you are trying to play a little slower and amass enough resources to you know play these upgrades so that the next turn you're just going to have so much dice on the table. But if you needed to change into more an aggressive stance over a mid range stance, what are you doing and how are you doing it? Yep. So I mean, there are times when my first rollout on my characters is you know some threes and twos or plus threes if I have an ancient out or something like that. And my opponent doesn't mitigate it. And at that point, I'm like, can I one-shot a character? And so, I mean, a lot of times I will have the dice possibly to do it. And I will aggressively re-roll in order to try and get there as opposed to go for resources. And then the other thing is if things are going poorly and I was not able to get my resources down or I was never able to get the uh, resources in order to drop my second weapon or something like that, then I'll just use all my... I mean, I'm a big believer in you know drawing cards, but then using all your cards every round because unless it's something that is perfect, like a deflect against the Emperor or a force max direction against a melee deck, you should be maximizing your card uses every time. And that means just re-rolling until you get exactly what you want. And you'll get a new hand of cards. And these days, the, uh, the format, the cards are just so good that you're drawing a new hand of five cards that's probably just about as good as the uh, cards that you discarded to re-roll. So I don't have a problem doing that. And I mean, it really, damage doesn't matter until you kill a character. So 
if you do seven damage and they still get a whole nother turn because they're able to save them or something like that, you basically put the damage on too early. And instead, you probably should have done something else like disrupt or get resources or something like that. So it is all about finding that way to kill that character and remove those dice permanently from the game. So it is something that you get a feel for, and I don't always get it right, but you know that's where you're sitting in the middle of that. Along with that, you kind of mentioned force speed and... One of the things is that, and I think Pearl Yeti on one of his things also mentioned that he uses it this way. A lot of times my four speed dice just sits out there. It's kind of my, oh crap, something's going wrong button. And, <laughs> you know, if they have a great roll out there and I don't have mitigation, I don't have a, a stick out there for my guard, I will use it to try and roll out and get my guard mitigation. Or I will reroll my Isla dice in order to try and get one of her specials or something like that. But, uh, in general, since I'm not going to be claiming the battlefield very much anyway, I would much rather get the shield or the focus off that die. But, you know, sometimes I've got an ancient lightsaber sitting with a plus three out there and I'll use it to roll in something and maybe be able to resolve, you know, that melee before they mess with it or something like that. So, I mean, it has various uses, but a lot of times it's just sitting there uh, warning, you know, basically sometimes I need to actually take a couple actions in order to actually get my mitigation going because it is all very conditional mitigation. So, And that's actually something I really wanted to address and people have been asking questions about that on Facebook and the forums you're not running a lot of mitigation, especially in a format with Empire at War. People are running a pretty decent amount. Are you using the mitigation cards with Isla's effect to kind of keep your opponent's dice off kilter? Or like, how how are you preventing your opponent from just doing whatever they want in case you don't get the rolls you need and they do and, you know, you don't have any way to mitigate away, you know, damage or disrupts or, you know, stuff you just don't want to deal with? Right. So uh, I only have five action cards that do mitigation, but I would also say that the cautions and the force illusions count as mitigation. So that puts me at a count of nine cards, which I agree is pretty low. And if I was more confident that Deflect was a great card, you know, because it's a lot of ranged meta, or if uh, I knew that uh, Force Misdirection was a great card because it's a melee meta, then I would definitely be slotting those guys in. But I just didn't know going into this meta what there was out there. And so I erred towards the side of pushing my plan through. And that meant I really wanted to make sure I got my two weapons out there and you know, threw all my dice out there. And yeah, if somebody gets a good roll, I will not always have mitigation for it. And, you know, that was a chance I was willing to take there. I will also say that Isla is just better than I thought she was. Like, I looked at her dice and I was like, okay, I think even if her, uh, her, and I don't like indirect damage very much at all. If her indirect damage is blank, I can still see that she's undercosted and this is very good. But that special is just really good because it feels bad to try and have to go and mitigate that special, but <laughs> it really messes with you when it's just sitting out on the table. It's like, unless you're going to cheat some type of action or something like that, I'm going to be able to soft mitigate you. And while I'm doing it, I can spin another dice, which a lot of times is an Isla dice. So I will mitigate you. I'll spin my to my other Isla special, but I'll just leave it on the table. I don't want to, you know, overdo it. I'm just going to sit it there again. So if you ever get another good roll this turn, I'm going to make you work harder to, you know, get up to whatever your max damage is this turn. So she is definitely an all-star and I never used Ray's ability to its fullest, but her dice and her her, her ability is a, a bunch of steps above what Ray was giving me when I was playing this deck back in Awakenings. And I do feel like there might be a learning curve to Isla just because she offers a lot of things. She's got good health, good points, good dice. But I, I feel like the special and the way she interacts with the game when used properly can give you massive amounts of value if you use it at the right time. Can you comment on that at all? So, yes, I will totally agree. And kind of like four speed once in a while, they don't do something really good and I let them resolve their dice because I'm worried about the reroll. And so my Isla dice will just turn into a focus for me. And that's something that I'm like, okay, you know, I didn't get max value out of her ability this turn, but you didn't do the worst case scenario. So I can live with that, right? So I've already, so, and then I just use it for focus. A couple of very interesting things that came up when playtesting is number one, if you're playing against her and you have one dice out there showing a blank and you shouldn't claim, and it's a blank on a dice that has five other good sides because to use Isla's special ability, she has to use both modes of it if she's able to. So she will actually force, she's forced to, if she wants to use her special, to change your blank dice to something actually useful before she can uh, focus one of her own dice. So that is something that came up you know, once in our whole testing, but I thought it was really interesting and something that people should keep be aware of. And the other thing is that like her in combo with four speed, you can do stupid things like play your four speed, use Isla's ability to actually turn their dice into something good because it's not always blanking it. You can turn it into something and then you can force misdirection, you know, and 
whatever that dice was, you change it to whatever you were going to force misdirect anyway. In order, and, and you get to you know set up your own dice to change to that range on your light bow or specials or melee, whatever they have, or money. And then you know you change everything to money, and all of a sudden you're force misdirecting three dice. So I mean that is a oh. really sick way to uh, really destroy somebody's turn. Man, that's nasty. <laughs> That is so dirty. I love it. <laughs> and in one game, I also had a situation where I had rolled out. I s- used Isla Special to turn one of my dice. So I have actually lethal on a character on the board. And so I knew he was going to have to deal with my dice. And so I spun his light bow to the range side. And this is back when I was playing deflect in my deck. So he had to deal with my dice. And then I was able to deflect the light bow into his character. So, you know, don't always change it to blank. Sometimes there's other things you want to change their stuff to. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Well, I mean, one of the biggest questions I have is coming out of this experience and seeing, you know, one of the first, if not the first, you know, dip into the Legacies meta. What do you think about it? Is it exciting? Is it, you know, going to be different? Or are we going to have, you know, similar problems, you know, the woes and fears of, oh, X is broken and Y is unfair and special chaining. Oh, my God, like it's all going to, you know, the game is dead uh, or, or which I don't believe is the case. Or, you know, what are your thoughts on where the game is going now that you've seen where these decks are coming and these players are trying new things and you took eight people and you have seven different decks that's awesome it was awesome and when i went down there it the meta was very similar i mean there was all kinds of decks over the field i will say that obi maz was there uh had the, probably the biggest contingent and obis were all over the place i mean sorry <laughs> not obis but uh yodas were all over the place but i mean it was yoda poe it was yoda zeb it was yoda reekin uh, yoda reekin jar jar i mean people were playing all kinds of different things with yoda so i mean he's out there and people are loving him probably because he's yoda but he's also a very strong character people have recognized that but nobody settled on what that yoda deck is and i don't know if it's going to be broken or not i mean there was a fair amount of teeth gnashing about the special chaining personally i think it's good and it's fast, but if you're chaining into specials, you're using half of that Yoda die just to get to another special. So you're getting a shield or a resource or something like that. And I mean, that's good. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying instead of using that dice for both a resource and a shield, you got only half the value of it because you're using it for focuses. And so, yes, you can do some crazy turns and that's all there, but I don't know that that is even the best way to play that deck because, you know, maybe if I can reroll, I can get just better dice naturally. Yes, it's slower and maybe it's mitigatable, but I can, you know, maximize my damage or force them to use mitigation, which reduces their resources and stuff. So I really don't know if any, I mean, nothing came out of this weekend that screamed to me it was broken. I think everything either was strong and you know you saw you know Tarkin and Seventh Sister do some crazy stuff in certain tables, but then it would you know lose to other things and stuff like that. So there was no FN type boogeyman as far as I could see. But I really think it's way early, and I think you know the beginning of these things always is a Wild West type situation. And so you know something very well might rise to the top, but. I wouldn't even want to guess what that is. Okay. So as we wrap up this interview, and once again, we really appreciate your time coming on the show and talking about just this really excellent and super fun experience. There's lots of people who are listening who are getting ready for their regionals, or they're just getting ready to get their hands on these cards and go to their locals. What tip or trick would you have you know, to give to our listeners if they're wanting to prepare themselves for this brand new wild west of a meta i I would say play what interests you i mean familiarity i think is the most important at this point in time i also think it's going to be i mean the thing that i took away from it is that it's really tough to guess what the meta is going to be at this point so those deflects and those force misdirections minimize them i mean i i did a lot of one ofs in my uh mitigation just because i didn't know what i wanted and i definitely didn't want to ever draw two deflects when they were dead cards so um that is one thing that i at least tried to do but um i think at this point It's mostly, you know, put together whatever interests you and what you uh, enjoy doing because you're going to have a much better time at it if you're enjoying it, even if you're not winning. Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. Congratulations on the win. And I'm assuming you're going to be participating in the Team Covenant Regional coming up. I will. And not only that, but I'm going up to Nebraska this coming week. So I get to switch back to EAW meta uh, testing for this next week. So that'll be interesting. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sugi. I appreciate it. All right. Well, that was a great interview. And once again, congratulations and thank you to Eric for spending his time to come on the show and discuss 
the event, his deck, and you know the decisions he made when playing. So thank you everyone so much for listening. We are the Knights of Ren. If you haven't yet, check us out on iTunes. Go ahead and subscribe. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. We've got lots of things coming out in the next few months. Major event coverage is going to be on Facebook and Twitter. I'm going to be doing live streams from my regionals, and we're going to have people doing coverage from their events. So definitely stay tuned for all the new stuff that's going to be hitting the table, interviews with players. We've got a lot of things scheduled that I think everyone's going to enjoy. Also, thank you very much to all of our Patreons for supporting our show. If you haven't already checked it out yet, we have a special edition podcast exclusively for the Patreons called Less Than 12 Parsecs. We answer your questions. We talk about some of our deck lists and things that are a part of the show. But more or less, our thanks to you for supporting us, giving you some exclusive event coverage, giving you exclusive ideas, deck construction. And we have Ask Us Anything segments where we'll just answer some of your questions. So check us out on Patreon. Thanks for joining us on this week's show. We'll see you next time. And may the force be with you.